some of you, um, this will be your first Zoom with us tonight, um, and hopefully you guys chance to see the um, the first session. I'll invite you to go ahead and mute your um, mute your screen if you haven't already. And just again with the Zoom protocols, down at the bottom of your screen or at the top, depending on your device, um, there's a mute button there where you can unmute or mute yourself. And for a group this size, it's really helpful to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, there's a stop video, so if you start to have um, a, an, an unstable um, internet connection, sometimes turning off your video can help and we can still hear your voice. Um, you'll see the participants. If you click on that, you can see all the participants that are on the right screen over there, but I think now everybody has their real name attached to them, so you can uh, see each other's names that way. Um, also along the bottom is a chat feature. If you click that little chat bubble, you can see that at the very bottom of the participant screen, you can actually chat with one another. And we will use the chat function at the end of our time together when we process a little bit about what we're um, learning. If you look on the chat function, which is on the right side of your screen, um, you go ahead, you can send the chat to individuals, but I'm going to go ahead and send one to everyone in the meeting. And then you just type where it says type message there. You just um, type the message and then it'll go up. And so at the end of our class session, when we talk about what we're learning, um, we actually enter that into our chat so we can read as we're typing and, and just pause in a little bit more silence that way. Um, we have a recording function and a breakout room that I'll be using as the host. You can make reactions, you can do a thumbs up, you can do a hand clap, um, whatever you'd like. So, so those are some of the bells and whistles of the Zoom call. Tonight, um, again, so grateful to have Dr. Ken Bedell, Reverend Dr. Ken Bedell. You know, he's a pastor and a, a PhD uh, educator and um, has, has just an incredible background in this work and in, in understanding racism, especially in the context of the civil rights movement. So he's really going to be our scholar in residence with us tonight. And we're so grateful, Ken, that you're with us and in Ohio, but still able in Ohio. to but but I participate in the church there with you when I'm... Yeah, that's right. That's right. He and his wife, Kathy, are, are usually here in Colorado, and so, so grateful to have him with us, too. Um, let me open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started, my friends. We thank you, God, so much for the gift of this time to learn and to grow and to be nudged into hard places and understand new language, new vocabulary, new awarenesses of how we can be better neighbors with those with whom we live and love and want to grow in relationship with. And we thank you, God, for a moments of, of rest and renewal that comes through learning and opening our minds and our hearts and our lives to a much bigger glimpse of the way that you would have us live and love with one another. Thank you for this time and for all the ways that your spirit will meet us and stretch us and grow us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So let me um, go to our screen share, and that's where I will put up, um, I'll put up our PowerPoint presentation for tonight so you can see that. Uh, hang on here. There we go. So we're, we're spending time tonight on, our, on um, chapter two, which really needed some really good unpacking and some conversation tonight. Here's our learning objective that we talked about last week, just again to create a safe space to be nudged into uncomfortable um, discussions and feelings so that we can, as we learned from D'Angelo this week, talk, start talking about this and, and break open this um, fragility and this kind of cloak of protection that white people create them around themselves to keep from having to talk about these hard things. Just a reminder about our learning covenant, um, those ways that, that we're contributing and also creating space and making space for others um, so that we can become not only um, better speakers, but also better listeners to one another. So just wanted to remind ourselves about that common um, space for learning. What we did last week and we'll do each time is um, put up a, a statement or a quote and just give you about two minutes to just jot down in your book or on your journal or on a piece of paper 
what, what do you do with this passage, with this, with this statement? Race is the child of racism, not the father. Let's kind of get into a learning space together by giving us about three minutes just to reflect on what that means for us and jot those feelings down as we're getting ready to focus on our learning together. And I'll be quiet for a few minutes. Sometimes when um, we've had busy days and things going on, um, it's really important when we get ready to learn intentionally to just kind of get a centering moment to get us back into that space of learning together, kind of get, getting in the context of, of the material we're working with. So that's really the, the purpose of a centering moment. Um, kind of what we do in worship at the beginning of the service where we open with prayer and with praise and it's a way to say, you know, everything else in my life is important, but I'm creating an intentional space for encountering God right now. So that's the reason for these centering moments. Okay, um, last week we, we did breakout rooms and Ken and I um, discussed that you all were so amazing at that, that there's no reason that we need to have big groups that only he and I are leading. So this time we're gonna um, break into groups of about um, three or four and um, we're going to take about um, 25 minutes to spend time in these questions related to the reading um, and also just where we are in this conversation. Last week, we, we challenged ourselves at the end of the class to share examples of cultural racism that you discovered this week. And this was a really helpful um, way of phrasing that that Ken gave us, that in the arts, TV schools and other social institutions, cultural racism is constantly sending messages that white people in their ways are superior. So um, let's, let's think about if we've had some examples. And if we didn't get a chance to think about that, we can add some if we have some. And then this, this idea that comes from D'Angelo in this chapter this week, we are all prejudiced and discriminate. Um, so I want to invite you, especially those who got a chance to read that um, out, of, out of the first part of the chapter, if you would, if you talk about how you feel about that. And then um, what's a big idea in this week's reading that pushed you into some new space? So certainly take some time to quickly and briefly introduce each other, do the math and figure out for each of you to have time to um, talk about each of these ideas. Um, Give, give a divider up. We will, um, it's 716 now. So let's do um, at 745, we'll come back. And here's an idea. Since I can't share this screen with you when we're in breakout rooms, take your camera if you've got one and take a picture of, of this screenshot. And then you'll have the questions to talk about when you're doing that, if you don't want to write them down really fast. We're going really high tech here. So uh, go ahead and, and take a picture of this screen if you'd like. Um, I'll keep it up for just a second. And then I'll go ahead and get us divided into breakout rooms. And if you would um, just watch it close to 745, but if you remember from last week, a timer will actually come up bef right before we get done so you can wrap up your discussion and come back. So anybody have any questions before we break out? 
We got this. We got this. Okay, let me. So everybody get a chance to get the questions down or thinking about them? Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna. Okay. Okay, we'll be back at 745, my friends. That light is not good. We're back, Amy. Great. We got um, some folks are coming back. I got about 30 seconds. Well, we'll just not sit there. Hopefully, you guys had a good conversation. Lots to talk about. Didn't get Amy, you well, to say hi, Sue Clausen. Good to see you too. <laughs> Amy, while people are coming back, I have a question. Um, do you want me to share my screen for the uh, sure. first three key ideas? Ideas. Yeah, I'll give you permission. There you go. So you, if if you're comfortable doing that, Ken, that's fine. Sure. Okay. So then I need to. Uh, If you just go to share screen, um, there you go. I think I just did it, didn't I? Yep, and just go to your, um, go ahead to your slideshow and push um, view show. Can, can you see my screen now? Or can you see? I yeah. can. Yeah, if you, if you want to take off all the bells and whistles around it, if you, if you scroll up to your slideshow okay. and just start yeah. show. Okay. Then you'll have an, um, advancing abilities from... Yeah, from current, there you go. And you can advance from down below in the left-hand corner, I think. Okay. I think everybody's back, Ken. Thanks so much for your discussion time, gang. And, and hopefully um, we all got a chance to live with the material a little bit. And now we, um, like we did last week, we're gonna have Ken especially help us with um, some of the 
key ideas that came out of chapters three and 11 with his, with his own um, gift of scholarship in some of these really important areas. So Ken, we're ready to learn from you. Okay. Uh, and again, like we did last week, if you want to interrupt me or you have um, a question or want to add something to what we're talking about, if, if you just put a note in the comments and then uh, Amy will, in, will interrupt me. So uh, I'm going to start with the history of white supremacy and, um, and kind of turn this around a little bit in that the question of white supremacy, rather than just talking about uh, whites feeling superior, what is it, how has been the history of uh, whites in relation to Indians, Africans, Hispanics, um, Japanese, the, the various uh, groups that the white Americans have uh, dealt with since coming to North America. And so to look at that history, at first, the settlers uh, in Georgia, um, when Africans arrived as uh, indentured servants, their first response was, well, they're not Christian, so they're not as good as we are. And that was the way that the uh, very first uh, British settlers uh, dealt with the difference between their Europe European heritage and the Africans who were coming as, as slaves. And, and in, then the, it wasn't long before they had uh, a little bit of shift in that and actually started to legally talk about skin color, that that was the way laws were set up that distinguished between uh, skin color or inheritance, how much, uh, how many of your ancestors were people of, of color and then you were determined to be um, black or white, depending upon your, your heritage. Um, even up to the, the point that, um, it, and I used Abraham Lincoln as, as a clear person that this is the way he justified saying that uh, Indians and Africans, particularly in his case, he's looking at Africans because he thought that they were just different culturally and that they couldn't get along with Europeans uh, in terms of their culture, white culture, European culture was superior. And he proposed that the uh, Africans should be moved out of North America, returned to Africa or sent to some place in uh, South America. And so that uh, the United States would be a white country with white culture and white people because of our, uh, our cultural differences. Um, around that same time, the middle of the last uh, the, the 1800s, biology became a big push of uh, showing that there was a difference in biology between um, blacks and whites. It was scientific, and so that uh, whites were superior because of their superior biology. There, there, was, you know, there were studies about brain size and, and uh, other biological features that distinguished between the races and the, the um, European, people of European extraction were, uh, had better biology or different biology. And then um, more recently, the, the uh, Indians and Africans and, and Hispanics have been categorized as inferior because of their character. And uh, that it was, in, that it's individual failings, that the, uh, the reason that Africans African-Americans don't succeed more in terms of being at the, that whole list that's, that uh, is in the book about how, how many are wealthy and how many, uh, where the uh, white people own sports teams and all of that, that it is uh, because the African-Americans don't work hard enough or because they don't take school ser seriously or because, uh, uh, young girls get pregnant at an early age, or th that it's uh, individual failings. And so th then this becomes the, the new, the next phase of uh, arguing that uh, whites are better because other people are I inferior. Um, so uh, that seems to me that sort of leads us 
to looking at the definition of racism, uh, which is always contested. Just as we quickly went through that brief history of some of the ways that racism has been justified and argued for and applied, that it's, it's constantly evolving. And one of the ways that we see it evolving right now is the argument between people who are carrying signs in the streets saying Black Lives Matter, and then those who, uh, I had this happen to me, in fact, I was, I was walking down Sheridan Avenue with my sign that said Black Lives Matter, and someone um, got out of the car and yelled at me, you're a racist, I don't, you know, and he says, all lives matter. Well, the, the, the uh, definition of what a racist is, are you, uh, is uh, in contention again, and is part of the process of us coming to grips with racism and, and what that means. Uh, uh, so uh, to, to kind of get at this, what are we gonna use as a definition of racism for today? Uh, I'd like to propose that we think of uh, the three categories of white racists, or even more generally, the three categories of how white people stand in relation to uh, racism. That the, the first are kind of the obvious. Um, white, there's a white supremacist. Uh, they believe that non-whites are inferior to white people and therefore uh, believe that whites should rule and manage non-whites. And they um, consciously make decisions and take actions based on these, um, on these beliefs that actually white people should be in power, white people should manage, and they fellowship with others who share those beliefs so that they're, uh, they're part of, of groups, of white supremacist uh, groups. Uh, so so that's, that's one, one end and one category of uh, white people in relation to racism in America today. Um, the second, and this is one that D'Angelo talks about, is just racist Americans. And those, that's those of us who have accept the benefits of having white skin without thought or embarrassment most of the time. That it isn't something that if we just take it as being normal that, that white people have, have certain benefits. <laughs> And that occasionally we notice or acknowledge white privileges, but, um, but we do little in response to that, that it's, it's just, what can we do about it? Well, that's the way it is, that it's part of our, um, it's part of that's, that's America. And, uh, and so uh, we, don't, we don't take it seriously. And, and then that both consciously and unconsciously we apply stereotypes to people of color, in particular, um, negative stereotypes, and that that's just part of um, uh, sometimes completely uh, without without consciously thinking about it. That, that that's uh, part of part of our um, existence is that uh, there are stereotypes, and in talking with each other, the stereotypes are are applied. Uh, I'm going to go on to the last uh, category then of um, anti-racists, and, and those are white people who um, recognize the power of negative stereotypes and attempt to eliminate them from thought and deed, to try not to act on those and to discover them in ourselves and, uh, <clears throat> and then to respond out of a recognition of the danger of negative stereotypes. That uh, we watch out for white people that are anti-racist, watch out for customs and practices that are racially biased and point them out and, and work to eradicate them. So where, wherever they are, if, if we see something that's racist that's happening in our church, then we, uh, we look at it and, and point it out and work to uh, eradicate it or in the places that we work or in, in our other uh, associations or, 
or relationships that um, we take seriously um, an anti-racist approach. And then that uh, an anti-racist participates in social and political movements uh, to change systemic structures to promote that, that promote and sustain uh, racial inequality and inequity. So that the, the anti-racist, another way to say this is to, to be an activist, to participate in uh, social movements to change the underlying structures and the underlying uh, systems. So uh, I was talking pretty fast and going through a lot of stuff there. I'm going to pause before I go to the uh, last to the last section. Does anyone want to comment or react to this so far? I. I I put on the screen a, a URL. I, I've, this last part about categories of uh, white racist, I, I've written um, a longer essay about this that I published on the website uh, civilrightsstream.net. And, and I did it by kind of looking through the eyes of uh, how would we decide whether we would call uh, President Trump a racist. So to, to look at the categories and justifying the three categories they're looking at here. Um, if if anyone wants to discuss that uh, further, uh, you can, well, you can read the, the longer essay there, but also if you sign in to that website, then you can leave comments there. We can even continue discussion, uh, participate in discussion about uh, white supremacist, racist, and, and anti-racist. Ken, I have a question. Um, you know, I, um, when I, this is Amy, when I've, um, when I've written about this and, and preached about it, I often refer to myself as a recovering racist because of my upbringing, but also as much as I try to lean into anti-racism, a strange thought will come into mind like, oh, well, of course she's late. She's African-American. You know, and, 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 I, and I resist that and I recognize it and I have to stop myself and really repent in that moment. Um, I have a question. Can, can I self-diagnose my, my place on the spectrum of racism or, or can I, do I have to depend on a black person to diagnose that from my behavior? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I, 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 um, certainly, there are um, times when interacting with a black person raises uh, our own racism in a way that we wouldn't, that we might not think about it. Or and and of course, there the the important thing is to always be open to be able to to hear that. But uh, I. I don't see any reason. I mean, I think I, I, this is my experience. So um, th that there are times when um, reading something or hearing about uh, hearing about something in the newspaper that it just helps me recognize one of those uh, stereotypes that I'm applying or some place where I am benefiting from. Uh, racial practices or where, where, you know, something even that I'm a part of or around is racist. So I, I don't know. I, I'd argue that uh, the answer is both. That that's the whole point is, is increasing what, uh, what I, I think of it as uh, be, gaining our sense of racism personally, our own ability to, to look at it like, like our, our uh, sense of humor, our sense of beauty, or our sense of style, um, that, that it's uh, uh, paying attention to those, those things. I don't know, does that make any sense? This Amy's quiet here. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we, we've, We've already, we've already um, been discussing the question about everyone has uh, prejudice. And um, 
So the, the question to follow up on that, just to take a minute now, is uh, can people of color be prejudiced? The question that often comes up and, and that D'Angelo um, raises for us. Uh, she has two statements. I just bring both of these up. Um, she, she says, people of color may also hold prejudices and discrimination against white people, but they lack the social and institutional power that transforms their prejudice and discrimination into racism. The impact of their prejudice on whites is temporary and contextual. So, so that uh, um, there's a difference then between a prejudice as I understand what she's arguing is a difference between a prejudice that that I just um, apply, you know, I don't like people without um, masks to come into my business because I'm, I'm going to discriminate and I'm going to discriminate against them and something that is really um, using the, the, uh, the prejudice, not just in that con contextual setting, but actually to support and pr promote uh, social institutions. And, and then sh she goes on uh, to say, um, when I say that only whites can be racist, so this is the answer, can people of color be racist? I mean, in the United States, only whites have the collective social and institutional power and privilege over people of color. People of color do not have this power and privilege over white people. Uh, I go on to, to add that actually white people uh, use their power to define what it is uh, to, to be black, to define the negative stereotypes and to, to determine what, what those are. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. And Amy, you can pick it up. Thanks, Ken. There was one question. Oh, sorry. There was one question, Ken, that came up on the chat. Um, D'Angelo talks about white nationalist. Where does that fit into those categories of white supremacist, racist, and anti-racist? Yeah, that, that white na nationalists are in that first group of people who um, associate which, with each other out of a commitment to uh, white people being in charge of the company, a country. I, I thought that her discussion of that was kind of helpful because she she, um, she talked about how uh, uh, sometimes that's even very manipulative of recognizing you know how can white people make sure that they preserve their power and gain popularity for that, even uh, the, the comment about saying what's acceptable to your neighbor, but still uh, promoting that uh, white supremacy uh, position. Thanks so much, Ken. I'm going to, I'm going to grab the um, presentation okay. back from you. So um, I need to stop sharing, don't I? I well, I, I've just, I've taken up the share now. So okay. yeah. You got so, it. Yeah, so I think we're good. Um, any other questions, gang, as we're moving to the next idea of um, naming white supremacy? Okay, I'm not seeing any chat activity. So one of the big questions that she raises and, and statements that she raises towards the end of chapter three and, and intimates through chapter 11 is this importance of naming white supremacy. Um, and, and one of the questions I have for us to think about tonight is, how does the church um, start talking about white supremacy differently? How do we, how do we um, have a, nar a narrative of a God who believes that all of us are of equal worth and value? Um, and how do we take back some of, the, some of the conversation around white supremacy that others are having and re-narrate that in the context of our faith. I thought, um, just as a kind of a fun, a lighter moment, I, I thought I'd share um, this video that came from a Saturday Night Live skit. Um, it was just on recently, but it was from a show a couple years ago. Um, and it really reminds us that people are talking about race in lots of different ways all the time. 
And what, what might the church's witness and story and message be um, as we watch how, how people are talking about these issues all the time, but they may be in code, they may be veiled, um, but we know the conversation's happening. Let's take a look. There might be a, a short commercial and I can't vouch for the quality of the content. WANU Midday News. Coming up, the mayor's office announced a bold new plan to revamp the city's infrastructure. And it's about time. But first, yet another gas station has fallen prey to an armed robbery. A Shell station in the 4,000 block of Pulaski Highway was robbed around 11.45 a.m. this morning, making that a total of seven gas stations to be attacked in the last week. Ooh, scary stuff. And we're told the suspect remains at large. But authorities believe they now have a credible description of the perp. The suspect, described as a white male... Ooh, love it! <laughs> I'm sorry, what? what? What are you two celebrating? Oh, nothing. We're just glad that we know what the criminal looks like. <laughs> and he ain't one of us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> anyway... The suspect <laughs> was last spotted fleeing the scene on foot. So anyone with this information is being asked to contact the MPD immediately. Yes, help us catch this white criminal. <laughs> In other news, a Ponzi scheme has shaken some of Miami's wealthiest residents. That's money off the show. <laughs> Clement Smith of Clement Smith Investment Securities is accused of committing this egregious white-collar crime. Right there in the name. Smith is said to have been operating a multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme. Yeah, you know black people ain't got that kind of money. Uh, he was arrested this morning in Boca Raton. <laughs> and look at that. Hey. He's black. Really? What? Okay. So I guess we tied, you know. <laughs> This is ridiculous. No one's keeping score. Okay, we have an update on that tropical storm we've been tracking. Let's hear from WANU weatherman Dennis Jones. Dennis? Thanks, Pam. What we've previously been calling a tropical storm has upgraded to a Category 4 hurricane. It's destroying just about everything in its path with incredibly high winds. Now, we're calling this one Hurricane Chet, and that's a white man's name if I've ever heard one. <laughs> And that makes two of y'all. <laughs> we the lead, baby. Back in the game. Gang, gang, gang. <laughs> no way. That doesn't count. Hurricanes aren't white. Well, unless they name Chet. Right. <laughs> okay, can we move on from this petty game, please? Oh, because y'all lose it. <laughs> Convenient. Okay, let's just get back to the news. A Fort Lauderdale man was apprehended outside of a cracker barrel. <laughs> Or cutting brake lines on a dozen bird scooters. See, only white people got that kind of time, okay? <laughs> okay, yeah. He's white. So what? So now we're down to one. Mm, it's not looking good for y'all today. <laughs> In other news, a shopper was apprehended by security at Oceanside Mall for assaulting a man who stepped on his Air Jordans. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you say Air Jordans? Oh, that's black for sure. Whoa! <laughs> You know, I knew it as soon as I saw it. Okay, okay, and how about this one? A local woman attacked a cashier at a nail shop after they refused to take her welfare card. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Police say they're looking for a 19-year-old white damn it. That's three, baby! Let's get that back. Police say a Latino man. Ah, skip no. that one. We don't need that. <laughs> Keep reading, keep reading. This incident happened in the Utah National State Park. Ugh, not looking good. <laughs> Family of the man now identified as Laquan Jenkins. Yes! <laughs> what is he doing? What an upset. A Laquan rock climbing in Utah? That's okay, we still tied up, baby. We tied up. Let's go, let's go. All right, next one takes it. Okay. A man. Dressed as the Joker. Dead it! Dead it! Dead it! Dead it! Dead it! 
So that was kind of a weird way to, to think about how we're talking and how we're thinking about Most, race. Most advanced. Oops, sorry, hang on. Ever. <laughs> Can't decide between buttons and no buttons? We split the div with a whole lot of this. Oh, That's uh, a half trail of buttons that say bail, 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 bail. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, we're, the conversation is happening in our culture in all kinds of ways right now. And I think what we need to be thinking about and, and what D'Angelo challenges us about is not to be silent on this topic, um, to find language, to find ways that we are ready to engage as the church and as the people of God in this conversation. So I think she opens the door in this chapter um, to how we, first of all, have to acknowledge our own vocabulary and understanding of racism and race. Um, and I think the challenge I'm going to invite us to is to think about how are we building a vocabulary and an empathetic heart and a wise heart to get ready to have different conversations as the community of faith. So we're going to move now into our, um, let me get our, sorry. I'm going to get our screen share again. Ken, can you put up, um, can you put up the, um, the PowerPoint again? I'm sorry, you're muted. You're muted, Ken. There we go. I understand from K from Katie J that you couldn't see the video before. I apologize. I thought that that was coming through. Was that the case for everybody? Yeah. Oh shoot! Well, thanks for being patient on that. I'll post that with the with the um, uh, video. Sorry about that. We, we could understand it. It was pretty funny. Okay. Okay. Well, I apologize about that. I don't know why it wasn't coming up on the view. But what we're going to do now is um, go into some one-on-ones and, um, and take just about five, six minutes with um, a partner, which you'll get broken up to ra with randomly. But we invite you to turn to page, if you have the book, turn to page 35 in the text. And, um, and, and here, Ken put up some of, the mat, some of the material from that. But it's a page just full of questions, um, full of questions about how um, geography matters when it comes to race. Um, our, the way we have discussions matter, the way we know our stories and listen to the stories of other matter. And geography matters, um, how, we, how we experience race and racial conversations based on the schools we went to, the teachers we had or didn't have, the neighborhoods we came from, the towns we went to. Um, I grew up in suburban, white, affluent St. Louis, and um, I grew up as a child in the time of the desegregation program that was mandated legally among many cities to um, desegregate the urban black schools and the white suburban schools. Interestingly, the way that program was developed, it was developed about um, uh, taking black students from the inner city and busing them out to the white affluent suburbs. So kids were literally put uh, in taxi cars at about five in the morning and bust out in rush hour traffic, a two hour drive to get out to the suburbs to attend school. And then they would get put back on a, in a taxi and driven back home. They couldn't participate in sports. They couldn't participate in any after school activities, but the system was never set up for privileged white folks from the suburbs to be bused into the city. It was a one-way trip. And that had a lot to, of influence in my understanding of race at some very formative years. I'll never forget my mother saying to me, when the time comes 
for white affluent students to be bused into the inner city, you'll be the first ones on that bus. But of course that never happened. And so what have been our stories about understanding race early on through schools, through the geography of our neighborhoods, through the understanding of when we had a, a person of color who was a teacher of ours. We're gonna break into pairs and just share that briefly again for about six minutes and then we'll bring up the 60 minute reminder for you, okay? So I'll be getting us into those rooms um, in just a minute. We need to delete our old rooms. Sorry for the technical difficulties with the video. That's frustrating. I think we have an even number, so we'll be um, splitting into nine pairs.
Hey, hey Robin, can you say hi to you? Oh, hi, Amy. <laughs> I put are the we, video. Are we going back to the to the? Um, we're done with our breakout meeting now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I put the video link of the of the skit if anybody wants to see that in the chat. Okay. Thanks. Pat, how are, you, how are you feeling these days? Pretty good. Good. I've, I've been Hi, doing. <laughs> Hi, Robin. I've been doing acupuncture, so my face is getting somewhat better. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm so glad. Me too. <laughs> Does it hurt? <laughs> no. It feels like I've been to the dentist, and that it's just numb. Hmm. Doesn't huh. hurt. It. I guess it could get <laughs> better. That may not have been enough time to process some of those stories, but um, I invite you to, to spend some time this week in your journal thinking about some of those stories and what we're learning um, about ourselves and our, the acknowledgement of our own stories as we're preparing and thinking about how the church and how the community of faith um, talks about this work and, and does this work in some new ways. Let me pull up our... Um, PowerPoint again. I did put in the chat um, um, the, the skit link if you're interested in looking at that. Now um, we want to just kind of close our time together by using the chat feature of, of Zoom to just click on the chat box you'll see the conversations, some of the conversations that have happened. Some of them have happened privately if, as people has just sent me some questions. So you may not see lots of conversation, but we invite you now just with a few minutes of silence um, to just be jotting in the chat, anything that you've learned this week from the reading um, or anything that you feel moved to, to, to do. Um, it doesn't have to be motiv being motivated to march, though that may be it. Um, it may be um, just continuing to learn more, lean into some more wisdom. Starting in July, which I can't believe is just this week, we are going to have under our race and faith ministry items on the website, a program called Justice in July. You can register for that if you'd like to learn more about that. And it's going to be actually a daily opportunity um, to work through um, some activities that Linda Gertenbach and Pastor Megan are going to be offering to really move from some learning and some kind of brain space into some uh, motivated um, action space. So if you want to register for that, you don't have to, you know, sign up to do everything, but if you just want to have a daily reminder of some things you could be doing um, as you're mo motivated to make some changes, you can do that too. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this screen share off and get us back into, so you can go ahead and see um, the chat on the right side. Can anybody not see that? Okay, and, and let's just be quiet for about two minutes and just jot anything that, that uh, you'll, you wanna learn more about or you wanna do this week based on our study. And Arilla's already started us off. Are you? I'm gonna do this. <laughs>
take about one more minute to listen and read to others too. Right. Very true. <clears throat> Just an aside, um, and somewhat in response to some of the frustration folks are feeling about relationships with Black persons, as well as, you know, our ability to be more active in these COVID days, um, we are having a more robust conversation now with an, a nonprofit organization called um, Together Colorado. Some of you may have heard that organization. Um, it's a real interfaith advocacy organization here in the Denver metro area. And uh, um, we're having our social justice team as well as our faith in action team are gonna be meeting with some of the representatives of that nonprofit. And that would lend several opportunities for the congregation down the road to be looking at partnerships with congregations, with people of color prim primarily as well as um, really working on some policy and advocacy work together in partnership with other black congregations. So um, that's just one way that we'll be hopefully um, going from the, from the talk to the walk and giving people opportunities to do that through the congregation. So you can stay tuned and hopefully we'll know a little bit more as we even unfold the study today. Thanks so much for your thoughts. And, you know, one of the ways that, uh, that this goes beyond just being a book study to a real opportunity for, for us growing in grace and faith is by um, saying some things out loud in our chat that we can uh, encourage one another with and um, hold each other accountable in love. Those are really important parts of doing this work. So thanks so much for sharing about that. I'm gonna go back to screen share real quickly just to remind us about um, next week's study. Again, this work is never done um, all the way. And so we're, you may walk away from tonight even feeling like, oh, um, I didn't get to put a bow on it. And, and there, that won't be a part of this kind of work, unfortunately. It's really an ongoing journey. So just to remind you that next week, um, I know it's July 5th, but you know, what's a holiday during COVID days, right? We don't. <laughs> Um, so we're still going to uh, gather on the 5th next Monday from 7 to 8.30. And if you want to read um, chapters 4 and 5, feel free to keep encouraging folks to join us um, uh, to, to look at the recording or to come with us next week and, uh, and be a part of what we're doing. Um, I, I'm excited to see each of you here today, and I'm excited to be on the journey with you. I'm learning with you for sure. Ken, thank you so much for your wisdom and expertise tonight. That was a real blessing. We are really grateful for that. And let's just keep the conversation going through the week. If you have other thoughts or ideas, um, shoot them to us and we'll be happy to pass them out to the group. Again, if you want to contact Deb at arvadaumc.org, um, she can get you one of the books if you need a, a book or you need to swap one out with one that you're still waiting on. So feel free to, to do that. I think we double ordered, so we got so many books Ooh. Now, um, you can give one to your friend, too, if you'd want. So um, thanks again so much for a great study tonight, my friends. Be blessed, be well, and safe, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much.